Okay, let's try to catch up. I might hold you for a couple extra minutes just to get lecture done. Because the exam is written, so I have to finish the lecture. All right. Um, okay, so we stopped here last time talking about antibiotics. And um, so methods of measuring antibiotics. One quick method that is qualitative, we call it the uh, diffusion process or disk diffusion method. So in this case, if you see here, there are little disks uh, that are placed in the agar. These disks will contain the sample. So let's say a little bit of milk sample will be put in the disk. And then the agar, you would plate it with Bacillus stereothermophilus. And then if there is antibiotic, you will see zones where you don't have any growth because the antibiotic will diffuse out and will prevent growth of bacteria. So that would be a quick kind of screening method. Uh, the other method that is more quantitative, you can do uh, standard curves and you can measure semi-quantitatively at least the, uh, the amount of antibiotics. That would be the charm test. It has the same principle as it's an immunoassay, basically. So, um, well, same principle as an immunoassay. So you will have a radio-labeled drug an antibiotic has been radio-labeled, and then the drug from your sample. So they will be competing on uh, the, for to interact with the binding sites on the bacteria. So if you have um, the antibiotics in your sample, so it will compete and bind to the uh, surface of the bacteria, and then the radio-labeled drug will not bind. And then you won't get the radioactivity. So the higher the amount of antibiotics in your sample, the less radio-labeled drugs will bind, and then the less measurement you'll get. So it's similar to competitive ELISA. Other quantitative determination is with reverse phase HPLCs, the common one. And, um, and then you can also do GCMS as well. So these are common methods of detection. To answer again what Lynn said, you don't have to remember this wavelength. Um, it's just it's a UV detection, basically. So moving on, food allergens. So there are concern and major recalls due to allergens that haven't been properly labeled on the food mm -hmm. package. So we have um, big eight, the FDA identified the big eight, which are, um, these are listed here, milk, eggs, fish, shellfish, tree nuts, peanuts, wheat, and soybean. They're listed as the big eight because they represent over 90% of the allergies outbreaks, so, or food allergies. So that's why they call them the big eight. So there is the Food Allergy um, Labeling and Consumer Protection Act. It applies to all food regulated by FDA, and it requires that all allergens are listed or possible contamination with allergen to be listed. So methods, there are two common methods for measuring allergens. One is protein-based protein methods or categories of methods, protein-based and DNA methods. So the protein-based, um, so immunoassays, usually it's based on immunoassays that can be quantitative by ELISA, or Western blood that are qualitative, or biosensors immunoassays. But here's an example of a Western blood. So you have um, ran 2D gels, and then you would the way we talked about Western blood last time is you run the 2D gel and then you transfer to PVDF membrane and then you incubate with the antibody and then with the secondary antibody that is labeled and then you will see spots indicative of antigen-antibody interaction. 
So if you're detecting which antigens are present and they're reactive, so you can see them here. Now, the difference between this and this, to highlight a very important concern with protein-based method, is how you're extracting the protein for analysis. So if you extract, in this case here, without salt, with salt, and here without salt extraction, that's just an example of, of extraction of proteins. Here you did not extract key proteins that are allergenic, so you are misguided here because you have not processed the protein extraction adequately, so you're ending up not seeing allergens that are present. <coughs> so protein methods are really dependent, highly dependent on how you extract the protein uh, to ensure accurate detection of the presence. Also the protein, if it's processed, if it gets denatured, for example, the, the antibodies will not recognize it, so it won't be detected, although it might still induce allergenic reaction. So it's very tricky, protein determination methods are very tricky, because proteins can be processed, can, how you extract them may impact uh, their detection. DNA methods, it, you know, DNA will encrypt the proteins. So another way of determining whether you have that particular protein or not is to look for DNA. And then you would do polymerase chain reaction method to look for those, uh, for the DNA. Um, however, there is a disadvantage with that. Let's say you're having a protein ingredient like soy protein ingredient and you're adding it to the food product, you're not going to see DNA from the soy because the protein has been extracted, isolated, and it was separated from the DNA. So in this situation, the DNA might give you false results. The DNA is not present. However, the protein might be present. So caution in selection of this method or this method depending on what you're looking for and what you know about the product. With that, we move on to another category, which are and other chemicals and contaminants that are not desired or not wanted. They can be either added, um, such as sulfides, for example, or nitrites, or they can be occurring due to processing, such as furans and acrylamide, or just contamination from packaging, such as BPA, which bisphenol A, or um, another one we'll talk about, or they can be adulterants, international contaminants adulterants. So there is a whole lot of different contaminants or chemicals that we are concerned about and then we need to detect their presence. So, so there are so many different uh, methods for their detection, but Obviously, the methods are time-consuming and expensive, and they rely mostly on chromatography and mass spectrometry. So, and then um, also the limit of detection is a problem because they usually are present in very, very small amount. Mm -hmm. So in order to detect them, you really have to have a really high sensitive method. That's why oftentimes LCMS or GCMS to get a very low um, to be able to detect very low limits. A lot of effort has been put forth towards figuring out rapid ways, inexpensive methods, as well as sensitive methods other than LCMS. So people are looking at IR, uh, for example, as, as quick methods for analysis. So sulfite is one of the main uh, residues of concern. So these are either present naturally or you add them. So and we talked about adding them to, to as a antimicrobial agents, preserving, or for anti-browning because they're reducing agents. So they can be added or they can be naturally present, like in wine, for example, they can be there. And some people have sensitivity to um, the sulfide having asthma kind of attack reactions. Therefore, there is regulation that if the product has more than 10 ppm, sulfides has to be put on the label. Um, 
So there are a lot of different methods, and most of the methods detect the free form of sulfide plus some bound form. It's very hard to detect all of bound form of sulfides. So this is the most common method that I would like you to know. Uh, there are other methods, but this is the main method, and it is uh, the approved method um, that would be used for labeling foods. So it's basically measured total sulfur dioxide um, that is produced from free sulfide and some bound portions of sulfides. So basically the sample is heated with HCl and your sulfide will be converted to SO2 and then nitrogen gas is bubbled through the sample taking the uh, SO2 through a condenser and you have a peroxide solution. The peroxide solution will oxidize SO2 and produce H2SO4. This can be either you weigh that gravimetrically or you can uh, measure turbidity. So that's the most common method. Now there are other methods, but these methods I'm just going to say FYI for now. Um, not, I won't focus too much on that. So sodium nitrite and nitrate, so they're used as preservatives and then in the curing of meat. So they give you the, the pink or red color and they are also, they prevent browning and also they are antimicrobial agents. So nitrates can be converted to nitrites and uh, some sodium nitrate are present in vegetables. However, there are legal limits for nitrites and nitrates, and there is legal limit because nitrites plus high temperature, and in the presence of protein, you get the nitrosoamines, which are carcinogens. And also, you might get a form of anemia um, <coughs> if you have high levels in the diet. So the AOAC method, you can either do a colorimetric method uh, where, the, where the sample reacts with the acid and treated with a, with a compound that would produce um, some sort of a color that you would measure. So, um, so it's a colorimetric reaction, basically. Ion exchange chromatography is another method for inorganic anions. You can measure nitrites and nitrates uh, by using the selective electrodes we talked about in the minerals chapter, or you can do test strips as well. And you can look at the um, procedure. I'm just not going to go into details just because of time. I'm rushing a little bit. Okay. Um, so this table is what you would want to learn. And the example question that I had in the review session is you can use this table to answer that example session, uh, example review question. So here it lists all sorts of compounds that are of concern at the present time. Yeah? Um, so the version of the table in the slides is just really weird and splotchy and kind of hard to read. Where did you get that version? I used this to put it in the chapter. So if you look in your textbook, okay. you'll have that table. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird in your slide. It's like, it was it's kind of blotchy. Yeah. It's so hard to read. Hard to read. It's dark and light and dark. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Then you will find it in the book. The exact same table yeah, yeah. is in the textbook. Okay. Yeah. But it summarizes everything you really need to know about these different compounds. So if you look at acrylamide, for example, it gives you where, how it's formed. So when you have carbohydrate-rich foods like potatoes, and then you cook them at high temperature, you have the aspergine amino acid with reducing sugar, you get the acrylamide due to Maillard reaction kind of product. And then um, what does it, why is it of concern? Because it's a carcinogen, neurotoxin, 
and um, me major method is LCMS. So if you look at each one of those, you have this information. So let's look at bisphenol A, for example. Uh, it's used in polycarbonate plastic. Bleach from the plastic can get into the water. And it mimics body's hormone and associated with multiple health problems, diabetes, heart problems, um, where it can be present, and methods of analysis. <clears throat> Furaz is another uh, product, metabolite, that can be produced due to high heat and retorting. For example, it's a carcinogen and present in a variety of food that's been processed. Again, methods of detection. Heterocyclic amine. Also, it's a product from Maillard reaction, so you have proteins reducing sugars and also high temperature. So when you cook the meat and you burn the meat, grill it and burn it, then you are producing quite a bit of the heterocyclic amine. And then again, the method of detection. Melamine, which is an adulterant used for economical gain. So you all heard of a pet food that was adulterated with gluten that had melamine. So it passed detection because melamine has a high amount of nitrogen. So it's passed detection because it gave you the amount of nitrogen equivalent to what would have been in the gluten. So it passed detection that way. Uh, also, it was put in infant formulas, again, to boost the amount of protein and reduce the cost and get profit. It causes kidney failure and it is, can be lethal as well. Um, let's see, the methyl benzophenone, it is a uh, chemical metabolite in ink, and there was a problem with uh, ink le leaking from the container or the box into cereal product. So, and it has, again, health concerns, especially for children with long exposure, and methods, again, LC and GC. Uh, monochloropropane, for example, is produced when you hydrolyze proteins, let's say soy protein, and hydrolyze it with HCl, and then if you have any residual fat in that, in that ingredient, then it will react with the HCl and give you this product here, and it's a carcinogen. Uh, nitrosoamines, we talked about it, nitrites and protein um, will get, at high temperature, you'll get nitrosoamines and their carcinogens. Percolate, uh, chlorate, is a fuel uh, contaminant, uh, rocket fuel component, and then uh, it might go cause hypothyroidism, it might get into water, milk, lettuce outbreak, but any crops really, it can be contaminated. And there are a few others. So this is kind of a summary of, the, of these slides here, which you can look at. This is, for example, melamine adulteration uh, detection using LC, GCMS, really, here, and looking at different forms of melamine and uh, using um, the GCMS. There are other different types as well of analysis. And this is another summary. The table summarizes all this information. So that's it. You just look at either the table or these slides. Every slide is summarized in that one uh, row for that compound. So nothing more or less. OK. So I'm going to move ahead to the next lecture. So the table is key. So if you can't see it through your uh, slides, it is in the textbook. Hmm? Okay. Last, the very last topic, sadly. Are you all sad? So sad. No, you're glad that it's over. At least you're honest. OK, the last one. Very fun and entertaining. 
and opening for an appetite. There they are. Analysis of extraneous matter. So lot of, lots of things go under extraneous matter. It could be insects, whole insects or parts of insects. Could be rodents, a whole rodent or a part of rodent. <laughs> you know, it happened. What? Have you heard about the, uh, somebody said they found a rat in their Mountain Dew and then Mountain Dew sued them back and said it's not possible because by the time the product would have been on their desk, the, mountain, the rat would have dissolved. Dissolved? <laughs> yeah, because they found that their product was so acidic and so terrible that like they would not have gotten a whole mouse in their drink. I think that's the case, but also it was like acid. Yeah, so it's fine. The, the whole rat will dissolve? I mean, it's not. At least parts of it. It wouldn't have been as whole. A whole. Yeah, it won't be whole, but you still will have some, the hair. But then you're like, yeah, that's not possible. They won the lawsuit. Oh, my gosh. Well, but it happened that a whole mouse or a rat, maybe, got milled with the grain to produce flour. Things happen. Yeah, it's protein. With a little bit more calcium from the bones. Okay, so rodents basically is the hair, the urine, the pellets, the, the poop pellets. And then the birds, also their urine, their poop, and uh, feathers. And of course, there's the less icky part, which is anything other extraneous. Extraneous, I mean, something, something from outside. Stone, sand, dirt, metal, glass. They're all non-wanted extraneous matter. So in some countries of the world, insects are delicacy. Yeah? And then they're trying to make insect proteins out of insects. And they will be soon in, in as ingredients in your food products. But as of now, there are pests that will start infesting our food from on the field, and then also during storage, and during transport, and during processing. So from the beginning until we get the food at each stage, we stage we have um, we have possibility to have insects and rod rodent. Um, contamination. So of course you have insects on the field, so you, when you harvest, you're harvesting either the whole insect or part of the insects with the grain. During storage, God knows where they're stored and who will get access to them. So mice, like this little guy over there, uh, rats, so they're everywhere. We can't get rid of all of that. So. Regulations. They're there. We cannot have a food product completely not having any uh, contamination. They're everywhere, but we limit them. So the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act states that food is adulterated if it contains filth, putrid, or decomposed matter. However, there is something we call defect action level. I mean, there are some levels that are acceptable beyond, wh beyond which there should be an action. That's what it means. Now, there are regulations to limit presence of extraneous uh, matters, such as good manufacturing practices. You learned about that probably in food quality. And then you make sure that you thoroughly inspect raw materials. So all of you that did the project, all of you worked on the project, so many of the raw ingredients had extraneous matter as um, the quality control test that you would do. So you want to make sure that your raw material is starting with acceptable raw material. And then during processing, you try to limit any exposure to additional contamination. However, like I said, there is no way you're going to have a filter-free food completely. Um, so for example, in peanut butter, 30 insects, fragments, and one rodent hair per 100 grams is the action level. So if you like peanut butter and jelly, imagine how, much, how many insects you've consumed already. 
Wow. Yes, hundreds of grams, like so they're just stocking a little. But look at the flower. It's basically all insects and rod rodents here. <laughs> 75 <laughs> insect fragments and one rodent hair per 50 grams of flower. Oh my God. You didn't know that? Welcome. So, yes, Walter. Uh, does the size of the fragments matter? Uh, that, we're coming to that. That's the size of the, unfortunately, that's one of the concerns. If it's one fly or a wing, it's called one. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Katie. I can't hear Katie. Well, we're coming to this joke right here. It's a joke. Hold it. This one only says 7% insect part on the label. No, it, it won't. That's a joke. So I don't think it's put on the label. It won't pass if you have higher than the action level. What happens if you do have like a whole pack and then later in the process it gets broken up? So then it goes over the level, but it's the same amount of flying. Yes, that's part of the concern, really. What, what happens is you have to... You have, they have to change regulations. And as of now, it's counted. One fly is counted one, and one fragment of a fly is called one. That's a problem. That's, yeah. So, yeah, you can see these guys having a haircut, and they... Luther investigates the sudden increase in rodent hair content. Okay, yeah. Wouldn't it be easier to, like, go by weight? So like an allowable amount of two grams per 100 grams? I know it's very difficult yeah. to measure, but... Yeah, if you want to work for government, go suggest that. Because they need, they need to change regulations. That's part of the concern, right there. Oh, well, I didn't get to the concern. Terminology. I told you this is an exciting lecture. Look at you. Contain yourself. All right, so terminology that you will hear. Filth. Filth has to do with animal contamination or other objectionable matter. Hair, urine, poop. Oh, well, you can say excreta if you don't want to say poop. That's another word for, for that. Heavy filth. So heavy filth, that means that these would be measured usually by sedimentation. Because they're heavy, they would sediment, so they call them heavy filth. So that's your sand, soil. Insect and rodent excreta pellets, they were sediment and separated by, by uh, sedimentation. Light filth, these that would float, and you have flotation methods, and usually they are um, oleophilic. They would associate with an oil layer, mineral oil is used in the method of separation. And uh, so there will be insects, fragments of insects, hair, feathers. And then another terminology is the seed uh, filth, which is separated by the size using different mesh numbers of the seed. So these are different terminologies that you might come across. Now here we go, the concerns. So concerns based on counts, counts versus size. So this is a known concern. They have to do something about it. I don't think they have done anything about it yet. So like here's the example. Your whole insect or a leg of an insect is counted as one. Um, another uh, concern is subjectivity. So how do we determine if this is fragment is a fragment of an insect? So you need somebody that would has some experience recognizing the fragments. Um, so it, sometimes it's really difficult. This we know it's an insect fragment, but if you have an insect cuticle, I think that's part of their exoskeleton, you might not be able to determine what it is. Um, so that subjectivity of the method is a concern. Another concern, yes, Molly? Well, what did you see if you were to see a whole insect, insect would you just try to remove it? Because <laughs> yeah, you would remove. You would try to remove it, but think about dealing with tons of wheat that yeah. you're processing in a mill. How many insects are you able to remove one by one? Well, I know, which is like sad thing. Everyone just wants to remove it. Yeah, if okay. you see it, you remove it. If, yeah. if it is, is that just let it go like process? Like, oh, process now. <laughs> Sometimes they just say extra protein doesn't hurt. <laughs> will increase the protein content in the flour. Yep. 
It's just filth. I mean, the insects usually, um, if they carry disease, yeah, they might make you sick, definitely. But in most cases, it's just repulsive. Yeah. Yeah, it's gross. I mean, you don't want to eat a leg of a cockroach, but sometimes you do, or you do a lot. Sometimes you do. <laughs> All right. So, um, so there are different methods. Uh, let's say we're, we're dealing with powders, and this is specific for spices. So, sieving method. So, you have the spice, and you run it through a 20 mesh sieve, and then you take what's on the sieve, remaining on the sieve, and you put it under the microscope, and you count it. And that's where you get a count. So this is another method specific for shelled nuts. This is for heavy felt, and it's by sedimentation. So you deshell the nut, and you do a defatting step first with ether. And then you would, have, you would add chloroform and carbon tetrachloride that will make the nut float and everything else that is filled will sediment. And then you would filter, you count the sand and soil, possibly under the microscope if they're not very obvious, or since they're going to be there in organic matter, if you ash, then you can get the weight of it. What? <laughs> would the shell of the nut count as filled? No, it won't, because they will shell they de-shelled the nut. They shelled nuts. So the nuts are shelled. The shell is removed. <laughs> OK. All right. Um, so this is another method that was developed for rye flour. And here we're looking at light filth for insect fragment and rodent hair. So here, what you, since it's flour and you have protein and starch and you have bran in there as well, so you have to do something about it to separate um, the components that you're looking for. So digestion with acid. So you digest the proteins and starch with acid, and then you, you add alcohol to prevent lumping. And also tween and EDTA are added so that you make they react with the bran and they make the bran heavy so that it won't float. Um, you don't want the bran to float. That's not part of the analysis. And then you add oil, mineral oil. So, and you use a, an apparatus that we called um, wild, wild man trap flask. It's called trap flask because you're basically trapping the oil and with it, you're trapping the insect fragments and rodent hair, since they are oleophilic, so they will be with the oil layer. So you have here the stopper, and then you would bring the stopper up, it will take the oil with it, and then you would have that portion that has the oil and the fragment, the, the light filth. You take that, you filter it on a filter paper, and you use you would use vacuum to filter because if it's very hard to, for the oil to go through, so you use vacuum to aid in filtering, and then you take that and put it under the microscope, and you count. Another method for light filth, um, and it's a flotation method. This is for post milling the flour. Again, same principle, you're digesting with an acid, and you add mineral oil, so there's the flour here doesn't have, the bran pieces are not large. So basically, if it is refined flour, you don't even have bran. So there is no need for the EDTA and the tween. So you digest with acid, and then you have the mineral oil, and you'll get separation, you separate the funnel. So you will have the aqueous and the oil layer, you separate those. Um, you filter, you wash with detergent, and then you count under the microscope. Now this is the interesting part. Yes. So the wheat can be infested. 
and you are basically an, allowed to have, I think it's 35 in 100 grams, 35 kernels infested in 100 grams. Yes. 35%. Well, 35 kernels, I believe. 32, to be exact. 32 insect infested kernels. Look at them. They're cute. No. <laughs> so you, you use x-ray to kind of see them and count them? But it's not an official method, the x-ray, but it's used to detect internal wheat insect uh, infestation. Yes, Walter? How do they determine, like, use limits? Is it, like, based on, like, how, how do they determine the limits is the question. Who knows? They just found it harder, harder to get less than that. <laughs> so on average, otherwise they would have to throw away a lot of crop. So they came up with this number. Yes. What would be the official method for finding the infestation if x-ray is not it? Well, you can, well, maybe there are other methods. But to count, I don't think there's another official okay. method for counting. But for, you can do, this is AOAC method, so you can measure uric acid to measure insect and bird excreta. And then you can do ELISA to measure specifically a protein from insect, the meiosa, which you will eventually eat in products. If it's, it's over the limit, would that do a recall? No, if the wheat is over the limit, then they would not be able to use it, okay. basically. So whoever, they, the farm will lose yeah, because they won't be able to get that from them. Okay. So, so they have to go to another sell. source. Okay. Yeah? Uh, so in that wheat that's used for giving that to the animals, like if it's not accepted for humans? Yeah, they give everything to animals, I guess. <laughs> yeah, they feed. Yes. It will go for feed. Um, NIR detect later stages of internal insect infestation of wheat, and then the microscopy. So microscopy can be done for metal types using scanning electron microscopy. There's a chapter on microscopy. Unfortunately, the semester is not long enough to cover all the chapters. So scanning electron microscopy, and also you can look at differentiating if you have glass, plastic, or other crystalline contaminants using light scattering, uh, uh, light scattering microscopy, LSM. Um, so preventative measure, so you start with screening the grain before you get to the flower, and you start with the limit, 32 insect damaged kernels per 100 grams of wheat. That is acceptable. You can accept and move on. Um, you can reduce the amount of insects um, and any filth really by mm -hmm. aspiration. So you would run the grains on um, belts, and then you aspirate. The light filth will fly off. Uh, air flotation, this is for heavy filth. That This is for stones and mud. So you can, the grains, you can put them on, again, belt with holes, and then you will have air underneath. So the little grains will float, and then the, the rocks or the little pebbles will just remain on the belt, and you separate them that way. You can crack open the wheat, and then aspirate whatever is inside the wheat, and then use magnets to remove any metal contamination. <gasps> Five more minutes. I can go back to the previous chapter, explain it more, if you like. Well, are you done? Yeah, I'm done. Hmm. OK. Wait, can I ask another question? Yeah. What is your like estimate of how much a kernel weighs? Because I feel like that's. I think for like 100 wheat kernels or somewhere between 3 and 4 grams, So 0 0.03 gram is one. Huh? Is that ever worth it for like companies like this sounds bad, but it's like to this have sounds. a higher insect count, like to make, you know, more money, mm. I guess. Like <laughs> they have more insect to have more protein? 
Ideal for a play. Does the ball that's missing from actual force that's actually inside cars make like enough money? Like, well, if the, anybody cannot go by regulation, but if they get caught, they will be either sued or closed by the government. They can do whatever they want, but if they, you get people to investigate them, talk to, to Tonya. Tonya, she'll tell you. Yes? I think it means if you have the magnitude of the law that's inside the flowers, is there any financial gain if you always have the magnitude of the law? Well, yeah, definitely financial gain in terms of not throwing away any pot, any ingredients. Yeah, there's a financial gain there, Sam. Mass, I can't hear Sam. I'll let you go in a minute. Would the mass of acceptable amounts of insects, would that be um, significant compared to like, the weight of a meat product? Like, I don't, they don't go by mass, unfortunately. They go by count. But that's the regulation. It's count, not mass. Tiffany. That's another question. Different from the lecture. Yeah. What did you say? Oh. I said, do we need to turn in our lab notebooks? No, these you can keep. Um, <laughs> you can keep, except for a couple that I might seek you personally to keep your lab notebook as an example. <laughs> I, do, I do have a collection. Yes. Uh, for the rating of our partners and products, is this a sale you? Yes. Oh, thank you for reminding me. Many of you have responded to my request of grading yourself and your partner. This is an essential component of your grade. I know many of you had good rhythm going on between you and your partner. There was no issues, but some of you might have some issues. So it is only fair that you send me your true assessment, because that will, will impact the grade. I need each one of you, those of you that don't send me will not get a grade on the project. I am dead serious about that. Send me your assessment. Yes. Can we give our peer the review right now for the class? <laughs> yes. Go ahead. <laughs> and she applauds you. <laughs> yeah. Is uh, anything about the project going to be on the test? Because I saw. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you, Carmen. I put up the uh, summary of. The, all of your summaries, the compiled summaries of your project. I would like you to look through them, not memorize anything. I, there might be a question that asks about an ingredient or a common product, a common ingredient or a common product. So think of a common ingredient and a common product. I might not ask stuff about uncommon ingredients. Half of the class worked on cheese, so there will be milk as a common ingredient. The other half on cereal, there will be flour as a common ingredient. So scan them. Scan the summaries. I put them on Moodle the last, I, I believe, the last week of class. Please look through them. Huh? <laughs> just send it in an email. I know this is like super minuscule, but uh, for the test, are they going to be like, if, if like the percentages are off by like that much or that much? Like, um, no, 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 no. And the final I'll Thank you.